In Jesus' name, amen. So if you'd like to sit and uh, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter 4, we're going to look at a great little passage. And um, we, uh, we thought about Moses this morning and the key theme there was uh, availability. And uh, I want to talk um, in this session really about Paul and I want to think, focus particularly on prayer. And uh, before we, um, we have this passage read to us, uh, when we pray, unexpected things happen as we, as we know. And you probably heard this story, but if you haven't, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you have, it doesn't matter. Uh, this was about a cat that got stuck up a tree, and so uh, it was owned by a vicar. Uh, cats have been on the news recently a lot again. So the vicar who owned the cat mounted a rescue operation. He climbed a ladder, and he tied one end of a rope to the narrow trunk, and the other end he tied to the tow bar of his car. He gently drove forward, and the inevitable occurred. The rope snapped, catapulting, sorry about that, the cat into the sky. No more was heard of the cat until a few weeks later. The vicar went to visit a member of his church, a young mum and her little boy, Johnny. In her front room, lying on the rug, was the vicar's cat. How did you find such a lovely cat? The vicar asked with thinly disguised innocence. You'll never believe it, replied the mother. My little Johnny's been asking for a cat for months. In the end, I got so tired of it that I told him to come out into the garden where I was hanging out the washing. <laughs> I told him the only thing to do was to pray. So we put our hands together and we looked to the heavens. Dear Jesus, we prayed, please send us a pussycat and you'll never guess what happened next. <laughs> so, the unexpected happens when we pray. Now, Jason, can you read sure. to us? Do you want this? Um, oh, yeah. You're okay. You're I, can, I can speak loudly. Um, okay, Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too. That God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so we thought uh, about Moses and the, the theme of availability, and I want to uh, carry on thinking about Paul and particularly the, the issue of prayer. Now, before we look at the text, uh, just I want to say a couple of things. Now, there are lots of ways of coming to Jesus Christ. If you talk to people, I mean, even in people in this room, and you will find that we all came to Christ in very different ways. And God used different methods to introduce us to his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, many people, and I think we could do this a lot, lot more than we do. We've gone, we've gone soft on the word of God. I don't know why. We don't read the word of God now. We, we, uh, we, we don't study the word of God. Go to the church. I was in India last year. You go to the churches in these, they really study the Word of God much more vigorously than we do. We've become blase about the Word of God. I think that's a real, real danger of the church in this country. But many people come to Christ by reading the Bible. I remember once I was preaching in Cambridge University and uh, I was preaching on that text in uh, Acts 17 and uh, there was a Several hundred students came to the meeting, and um, for some reason, uh, while I was speaking, I said, now, if you'd like to become a Christian, then I'd love to see you afterwards, and I've got a little book which I'd like to give you. And if you, and then I added this, and it wasn't in my notes, if you think that what I've said is a load of rubbish, rather than go outside and say, I've just heard a load of rubbish, come and see me and tell me it's a load of rubbish. I'd much rather that. So, 
after the talk was finished, a queue of people came to <laughs> see me. Well, a queue about 12 or 15, and many of them wanted to give their lives to Christ, and some of them did there and then. But there was one man, I think he was the fourth man, he was tall, like John. He had long hair, quite a striking face. It turned out he was the vice president of the union. He was a big debater. And he looked at me, he's a nice guy. He looked at me, or looked down on me, and, uh, and he said, um, I've come to tell you that what you said was a load of rubbish. And I said, well, thank you so much for telling me that. I appreciate that. And I said, um, may I challenge you? Uh, and he said, yes. I said, I'm going to give you a gospel of John, and I challenge you to read it five times. He was a thoughtful sort of person. I said, and then contact me when you've done that. So I gave him the gospel. I uh, went back to London. I was working at All Souls. And you can imagine my surprise and delight when I got... Uh, oh, oh, and I said to him, uh, uh, as, we, as we finished, I said, oh, what's your name? He, it was an unusual name. He said, my name is Tom Fish. So I said, okay, well, I'll pray for you, Tom Fish. And uh, I went back to London, and then a week later, I got a letter from Tom Fish saying, dear Roger, you'll never guess, I've read the Gospel of John three times, and I've decided to become a Christian. It was wonderful, and I forgot all about him. And then about 30 years later, I was speaking at a big Anglican conference in Blackpool. Uh, it was called NIAC or something. I can't remember what it was. It was all about church growth, and we'd seen dramatic church growth, so they kind of wheeled me out to talk about it. And uh, so I was giving this talk, and then I said at the end, now, if there's anybody, if you've got any questions, I didn't say if you think that what I said is a load of rubbish, but I said, <laughs> if you've got any questions, I'd love to meet you and chat to you, and a queue of people queued up to see me. And in the queue was an older man, looks a bit like John, actually, uh, gray hair, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, like me, and uh, still tall, uh, different glasses, and he looked at me and he said, uh, do you remember me? I said, no. He said, I'm Tom Fish. I said, oh, what do you do? He said, I'm a vicar. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So, all he needed to do was to read the scriptures. Are you giving scriptures away to people? Do you do that? Do you have a copy of a gospel that you can give to people? Because lots of the people that you know in Shipley have never read the Bible. They've never read it. And they're, they're, they're working on second-hand ideas. They pick up rubbish off the television or just junk stuff they pick up from newspapers. They've never read a gospel. And if you, had a, if you all had gospels and you gave them out, just think of the effect that that would have. Ask God to lead you. Don't just give them out to any. Well, you can give them out to anybody. But ask God to lead you to people, and he will. So some people come to Christ through reading the Bible. Some people come to Christ through a vision. I was in Middlesbrough last year doing a mission up in Middlesbrough. We had a great mission up there. Many people responded. We had Sentamu with us. We thought we'd get 100 people. 600 people turned up to hear him. And I met lots of Iranians who are coming to Christ in Middlesbrough. And do you know how they come to Christ? Many of them come through a vision of Isa. He appears to them. My, one of my sons and his wife have just gone to work among Syrian refugees in Jordan. And the most amazing things are happening amongst Muslims. They reckon that over a million Muslims, we don't read about this, are coming to Christ every year. And they're coming through visions and dreams. They're directed to God's people. And then they start to read the scriptures. So they begin to understand who Jesus is. And then they come to put their trust in Isa. So many people come through a vision, particularly where there's no scriptures or you can't get access to scriptures. Many people come to Christ through teaching, just through teaching. And that's where Alpha is so important. On the Little Estate, we started running. Straight away, the first thing we did is run an Alpha. We've got two people from our neighbors on the Alpha. One is a, a little atheist of 86. She's called Dorothy. And she's been coming every week. And as she hears the gospel through the talk, we use the videos, with Nikki Gumbel, as she hears, you can see her eye. She's not a Christian yet. There's a serious risk, I think, that she's going to 
become a Christian. And uh, there's a single mum called Stacy. Uh, she's just a young girl. She had a baby. She's been coming. She's given her life to Christ. And then the local electrician, Nick, from the from Coronation Street round the corner. He he's give, he gave his life to Christ on Sunday night. My mother became a Christian through a talk given by the vicar who brought me to Christ in the West End. He was speaking in the Taifa Hall in Nairobi. And the thing that clinched it for my mum, as John Stott, that, my, that for my mother was when she heard a talk on the cross. She'd never understood the cross. She never knew why Jesus had died. She'd never understood it. Even though she'd gone to a convent as a girl in Liverpool, she never knew why Jesus Christ died. Once she understood why Christ had died and how he died for her, she opened her heart to the Lord and she became a Christian. She's now in heaven. So, and some come to Christ through a sermon. I came to Christ through a sermon, but it was through primarily the witness of John Hughes. Because I'd never met a Christian. I didn't know what Christi real Christians were like. I'd never met them. I'd met school chaplains and I'd met religious vicars, but I'd never met a real Christian. And when I did, that was, had a huge uh, uh, impact. So what I want to try to say to you is that most people come to Jesus Christ through the loving, persistent, faithful friendship of somebody who is close to them. And God uses all these other methods, often to bring us to that step of commitment. But generally speaking, I find that when a person becomes a Christian, there has been a friend in the background, praying, loving, caring for them. Nearly always. Very rarely do people seem to come to Christ right out of the blue. Sometimes they do. And I, I've got stories of people who seem to have been converted right out of nowhere. But nearly always there's a friend in the background. So let's have a look at this um, little passage in Colossians. And I want to try and draw out some simple principles for us. It's a fantastic passage uh, about sharing our faith with those that we know. I want to talk about, I'm not talking about going up to people in the street. Uh, some of us absolutely die when we have to do that. Others of us love it. I absolutely love it because I'm wired that way but I'm aware that I'm, I'm very rare, and most people don't like that sort of stuff, but if I wasn't a, an evangelist, I'd probably sell double glazing. I mean, I just enjoy, I enjoy that. Go off and visit all those people. I love it. I absolutely love it, because I'm, I'm built like that, and some of you are like that. Not many of you, probably a tiny percentage of you, just as well, because we're not usually, we're a bit an annoying people like me. Um, but um, I want to quote uh, something I read from... Hudson Taylor, who began the mission, uh, the, uh, can we go on to the next slide? He began the China Inland Mission. Yeah, next one. And he said this, and this is so important, and I want to base what I'm going to say on the passage on this. We had to learn to speak to God about people before we learned to speak to people about God. I'll just say that again. It's really profound. We had to learn to speak to God about people before we learned to speak to people about God. Now, let's have a look at the text. If you've got the text open in front of you, I want to look at what Paul says, first of all, about talking to God or speaking to God about people. And he says a number of things here in verses 2, 3, and 4. Because Paul tells us here, if we go on to the next slide, First of all, he tells us how we should pray. Now, look, look at the text. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So, the first thing he says is that we need to devote ourselves to prayer. And the Amplified Version is very helpful. It says, be earnest and unwearied and steadfast in your prayer life. It's the same word that Luke uses when he's describing the early church. Do you remember in Acts chapter 2, when he says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. They devoted themselves to prayers. So if we want our families and our friends 
and our neighbors to come to Jesus Christ, we must devote ourselves to prayer. And devotion to prayer is a characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ, who not only prayed on certain special occasions, but he also would slip away regularly to pray. And uh, Lancelot Andrews, who was a great theologian and preacher in the Middle Ages, he said this in his diary, he, he did one list of all the times of prayer that are mentioned in the Bible. And he came up with a list, always, without ceasing, at all times, three times a day, every morning, at noon, seven times a day, in the morning, a great while before day, by night, at midnight. So you can pray at any time. There's no special time. Now some of you, like me, are terrible in the morning. I am terrible. My wife gets up, she goes off very early in the morning to the gym. I stagger out of bed, I sort of, well, you know, I make myself a cup of tea. I get up with her. I try to get up very early in the morning, even though I'm terrible at it. I get, I force myself to get up and then I go and I sit with my tea and I read my Bible. And I always go to a certain chair in a certain room and that's where I go to meet with God each morning. And I'm terrible. So don't look at me and say, oh Roger, you're, I am not. I am lazy, I am overweight, I am undisciplined. You watch me eat the biscuits. I would do all that. I was just having some sugar. And somebody said, oh, you're, you're keeping fit, aren't you, Roger? And I said, yeah, I need some energy. Um, so, so I'm just trying to say, but you've, just got, you've got to find a time that works for you. It's te I couldn't do that when I had all, we have five children. I, was, I used to die. I used to, I, was, I used to think I was going to die when I was in Edinburgh. The church was exploding. I had five children and they were all little, and they were five, five children under the age of seven. Imagine that. Just imagine the horror of that. How did we live? We lived. We're still alive. So you have to find a time that suits you, that works. But the key is regular and often. You don't have to pray. Most of, you, most of us cannot pray for an hour. Some of us can, but most of us can't. Pray for what you can. Do what you can, not what you can't. Do what you can, but be regular every day. Seven prayerless days make one week. We've all heard J. John say that. So, list of times of prayer. Secondly, places of prayer. In the, and Lancelot Andrew said, in the assembly, in the congregation, your closet, upper room, housetop, the temple, on the shore, garden, on their beds, a desert place, in every place. So you need to find a place. Now, I find I'm so terrible in the morning, I go to sleep. I just go to sleep. Get me praying and I'm asleep within a minute. I'm snoring away. So you have to learn to pray, uh, which I'm gonna move on to now, because he not only says, devote yourselves, he then says, look at the text, he says, be watchful. Now, do you know what it means to be watchful? It means don't go to sleep. <laughs> be watchful. Stay awake. Stay alert. One lady in our congregation, in our little Coronation Street, Coronation, uh, Coronation Street congregation, she was the PA to Brother Andrew. People turn up, don't they, in the most amazing places. And, she, and I said, oh, Sandra, I'm so terrible. I go to sleep in the morning. She said, well, get up. Walk around the room. You won't go to sleep if you're walking around the room. The Jews used to pray. I've got holes in my uh, pullover, so forgive me. Uh, the Jews used to pray with their hands up. You try going to sleep with your hands up in the air. You'll never do it. Uh, I discovered early on that I would not go to sleep with my nose into the carpet. So I would lie... For, I, I, had a, I had a Persian... Muslim living with me and he, he came into our flat in London and he saw me lying face down with my nose in the carpet and I think he thought I'd become a Muslim and I said no I'm I, I pray to Isa uh, and uh, I said but I don't go to sleep in this position the key thing is oh pray out loud I remember leading a house party at Cambridge again 
at the university, and I had Martin Goldsmith on one side. Do you remember Martin Goldsmith? Wonderful man of God. And I had another amazing man of God called Rupert Bentley Taylor. He worked with the Wycliffe Bible translator. They were both men of God, and I was in the middle. I wasn't the man of God. I was just a young preacher getting going. And I listened, because the walls were very thin, I listened to Martin Goldsmith crying out to God in the morning through the... And I had Rupert Bentley Taylor crying out to God in the room on the other side of me. I thought, gosh, this... so I started crying out to God uh, as well. So pray out loud. You won't go to sleep if you pray out loud. Uh, and the other thing I want to just say on this is learn the type of prayer that suits your personality. Now, I am not an introvert. So if you said to me, Roger, I want you to have one hour of silent contemplation in a monastery, that would kill me. That would, or, or, or no, I've been on, I've been on, I have been on a five day silent retreat, me. I went on a five day silent retreat in a Jesuit monastery, me. Nearly killed me, it nearly did at times, but I broke through, I broke through into God's presence. I used to meet with a Jesuit man in Edinburgh because I was so struggling with so much stress and you know with my young family in the parish and this young this Jesuit used to he used to teach me he said you've got to you've got to talk to your soul and he taught me all about consolation and desolation I didn't know any of this language because of the I'd been brought up in the evangelical tradition so I had to learn to listen to God but I find that for me the best way for me to pray is with other people. So I, have, I go to lots of prayer meetings every week. I probably pray, on average, between four and five hours a week, with pe mostly with people. I pray by myself, but I pray with others, because I don't go to sleep when I pray with others. Never go to sleep. And it keeps, gives me energy, because I'm wired like that. That's the way, so I need to go and pray with others. And if you're wired like that, and you don't need to feel guilty that you can't spend hours in silent contemplation, because that's not the way you are. You need to go with the kind of person that you are. And I want to say that because there's a lot of false guilt about this stuff. And we all tend to elevate the silent contemplatives. And some of us are not silent contemplatives, and that's okay. So be watchful. And the other thing that he says is, next one, be thankful. Look at the text again. He says, be thankful. And thankfulness is so important. It's interesting how often Go through Paul's epistles and find out how often he says, be thankful. Just look across at chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. He says it again in verse 16. Singing to God with gratitude. That's with thankfulness in your hearts. He even says it again in verse 17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. So the fact that Paul says it three times in the previous chunk shows how important it is. At, when we have dynamic prayer, at, we have this dynamic, what's called dynamic prayer, from 7 till 8, every Tuesday morning at St. Mike's, we always start with thanksgiving. Always start your praying with thanksgiving. Thank God for all the blessings that he's given you. And there are so many. Okay, so, and then secondly, he says what we should pray for. Next slide. And he tells us, first of all, we need to pray for open doors. Pray that God will open a door for Christ. And we need to pray for open doors. It's, it's amazing. Go through the epistles and find how often Paul uses that phrase, open doors. He uses it in 1 Corinthians 16, where he says, a great door for effective work has opened for me. He uses it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. God has opened a door in trust. So you need to be looking for the doors that God is opening. Now, I'm going to tell you another story. This was amazing. When I was in Edinburgh, we used to pray with all the clergy uh, up on uh, Carlton uh, Hill, sometimes on Arthur Street. We prayed for revival. Uh, and it was when the Toronto blessing broke out. And that happened to us before we even went to Toronto. We were all flat on the floor. Uh, I don't, uh, that's never happened to me before. God just came and we were all head down or back down on the, on the floor in a little church down in Leith. And one of the chaps in the, uh, who used to come to me was slightly odd. You know, the prophetic types are often a bit odd. 
if you, if you notice that, they're, they're, I'm not looking at anybody in particular, but, but they're often a bit weird. And there was this chap, he had the amazing gift of prophecy, a bit weird, led a house church in a pub, it's called Tony. And he said, oh Roger, I hear you're going off to Vancouver. And I said, yeah, yep, God's called us to go to this uh, broken down church in Vancouver. We'd been in Edinburgh for 10 years and I felt God was moving us on. He said, do you mind if I pray for you? So I said, I'd love that. We were in the car park outside the church, put his hand on my head, started to pray, and then he started to prophesy over me while he was uh, praying. And he described, it was like a visual prophecy, he said, you're going to get to Vancouver, and then he said, I can see fire, fire in Vancouver, and then he described the fire spreading up from Vancouver, up over the Rockies, into Alberta, and then across the prairies, right up into the Yukon, among the Eskimo, and then up the St. Lawrence Seaway. And I thought, do you know what I thought? I thought, you're bonkers. You are completely bonkers. But I, I didn't say that. I said, oh, well, thank, thanks, thanks a lot, Tony. It's very kind of you to share that. Because I thought, I, nobody knew me in Canada. I didn't know a soul when I got, I probably knew one, one friend. I had one friend in Vancouver. So we arrived in Vancouver. I'd been in this church, this little church, started to grow by God's grace. And for some reason, I got in touch with Nicky Gumbel and Sandy Miller. And I, this was in 1991. No, it was 95, 95, 96. And I said, would you come to a tiny little church in downtown Vancouver and teach people, because nobody nobody had heard about Alpha, would you teach them about Alpha in Vancouver? And Nicky said, we'll come. He said, is there fresh snow there? Uh, in other words, uh, not that he was going to go skiing, but that, you know, is it, is it pure? You know, is, it's complete. I said, there's just lots of fresh snow here, Nicky. So he arrived with Sandy and Fisher, one or two others, a chap called Jamie Haith, who was a young student then, they came to our church, 500 people came to the church for this, the church had never seen 500 people in it. They came from all over Vancouver and, and the Holy Spirit came in great power at the meetings. And then Nicky looked at me and he said, Roger, I'd like you to head up Alpha in Canada. I said, okay. He didn't know I could not organize a booze up in a brewery. I am the world's worst administrator. He said, I said, yeah, that's fine, Nicky. If you want to do us to do that, we'll do that. And my wife had met a lady called Sally, whose son used to play in the same football team as our twin boys. And she said to me, Sally would be good. She's, she's organized, Roger. She could organize it. So we set Sally up. We had a little laptop, and we set her up in an office in the church. And Alpha Canada, which was me and Sally, was launched. Within four months of that conference, 150 Alpha courses had begun in the lower mainland of Vancouver. I then watched it spread like fire. It was just like fire. And it spread up over the Rockies to Edmonton, up into Calgary. I was getting asked to come and speak all over Alberta. And then I watched it spread like fire up into the Arctic. I was even invited by the bishop who works with the Eskimo to go and teach the Eskimo on Baffin Island. I couldn't go because it was too expensive to fly there. Well, I felt it was. Maybe I should have just gone. Uh, to teach the Eskimo. And, and then it spread up through the St. Lawrence Seaway and it spread right across Quebec. So that by the time I was only in Canada for four years, when I came back, there were over a thousand Alpha courses that was, were happening all over and hundreds of people were coming to Christ. Now that was God. That was God. And something else miraculous happened and it was through prayer and it was through God opening a door. A chap rang me one day and he said, Roger, can I take you out to lunch? I need to talk to you. So this chap turned out he was one of the wealthiest businessmen in Canada. I didn't know this at the time. He's a very striking, good-looking man, young man, had a beautiful wife, 
He had beautiful children. He had a beautiful house. He had a beautiful car. He had a beautiful yacht. He had a beautiful ski lodge in Whistler. He was one of the beautiful people. And then he said to me at the end of the lunch, Roger, you've got to help me. I am so empty. My life is so empty. So I looked at him and I said, well, would you let me take a, a little, he, did, he didn't know about Alpha, would you let me lead a discussion group, in a, a, but I need a boardroom. I'd never done this before in my life. I said, could you get me a boardroom in downtown Vancouver? So he said, yeah, I think I could find you a boardroom. And I said, so he introduced me to a gold, a guy who was in gold in Chile and Katanga. He was a very multi-millionaire friend of his. And I thought, well, I just need to be a bit casual here, you know. So I turned up in jeans and open shirt and jacket with my little alpha promo video. We had videos in those days in my pocket. And I was met by this incredibly sophisticated gold person. And, uh, and he took me in and with John, John came with me, my, this chap, and uh, I said, um, can I just show you a little video of this thing? And I put the video, and I stupidly had not watched it. I just thought it would oh, be fine, it would be fine. And there were all these people singing about Jesus, and people going, oh, Jesus, you know. And I was thinking, oh, golly, he'll, this guy will kill me. He'll kill, absolutely kill me. So it was lasted for 10 minutes, and then I turned it off, and I almost said, well, you won't want me, will you? And he said... He said to me, he said, I find the idea that Jesus Christ is the only way to God very offensive. So I said, well, would you mind if I talked to you about that? So he said, no. So I then had a 40-minute discussion about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ with this chap. He was called Bill Rand. We were going like this. And John was watching it. It's like tennis, you know. He'd make an argument. I'd come up with a counter and then we'd... And then at the end, I said, well, that's probably it. You won't want me to come. He said, no, he said, I like you. I don't agree with what you say, but I like you as a person. You can use my boardroom. This was on the 24th floor, overlooking the Rockies and the marina where all the boats were. He said, you can have it, and you can have it every Tuesday from 12 o'clock, because lunch in Vancouver is at 12 o'clock, not 1 o'clock, from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. So I said to John, my Mackay, I said, could you bring some friends to join us? And he said, well, how many friends would you like? I said, I'd like you to bring 12 friends. So he invited 16, and uh, 12 came. And they were all millionaires, all of them. John was a billionaire. I didn't know this at the time. Eight of them came to Christ on that course. We ran it every lunchtime. We had one hour. I'd play five minutes of Nicky Gumbel. Then I'd summarize the rest of Nikki's talk in five, I learned to summarize it in five minutes, and then I'd open it up for discussion, and we discussed it. Do you know, that was the first, what was called alpha in the workplace. It's never been run in the, in the workplace. People came to watch how we did it. That has now spread all over Japan, China, Korea. Just started with that one conversation with that man in Vancouver. Now, that is God. That is God. You cannot, I cannot explain that any other way, except that God opened a door for his message. So, we need to pray for open doors. And then he says, secondly, we need to pray that the gospel will be preached clearly and boldly. Look at the text, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may Proclaim it clearly as I should. So we need boldness and we need clarity. Now, can I say to you, you won't have boldness in the pulpit or you won't have fire in the pulpit unless you've got fire in the pews. What's the preaching like? If it's not strong and bold and clear, it's because you're not praying. You'll get the preaching you pray for. And I found that at St. Michael of Belfry. When the church prayed, the message was strong. It was clear and it was bold. When the church didn't pray, it was muddled. 
It was vague. It was indistinct. So you need to pray for all those who have the job of preaching the gospel. The preaching of the gospel, week by week, is the way that God will save. He'll save many people. He'll bring people. If they know that when they go there on a Sunday, God's going to feed them and teach them and challenge them, they'll come. They'll come. And we've lost that. We've lost it. For some reason, we've taken our, our, our eye off the ball. And another thing we've lost is calling the parish to pray. We don't pray now. We used to pray as a church. We don't do that now. I've seen that happen in my generation. When I was a young curate, we used to have 400 people praying in the basement of All Souls every other week. And there was powerful ministry. Many, many hundreds of people came to Christ at All Souls in the time I was there. They were coming to Christ. Sometimes they were coming to Christ like you were fishing them in all the time. We had 80 to 90 on beginners courses every term, six or seven beginners courses, training them to teaching them the faith. That's not happening now. And one of the reasons it's not happening is because we're not praying as churches. We've stopped doing it. Now, I know that culture's changed, but I want to challenge you to really learn to pray. And I could talk to you a lot about this because I feel so passionately about this. Pray together as a church. And if, if you've stopped the prayer meeting, then pick it up again. Find a time. The older ones of you who don't like, and there are a few of us here, who don't like going out. I, even I'm getting a bit like that now. Don't like going out so much in the evening. What, do you have a, an intercession group? I bet you do. Every week that you're praying for the ministry of the church and really interceding with God. Some of you who are older could do that. You could commit yourself. At St. Mike's, we have an older intercession group every Tuesday. Then the younger ones who are going off to work, we catch them before they go to work. We give them, we have prayer for an hour. Then they have a croissant and then they rush off to work. We do that every week. Every week we pray. So we have a prayer meeting every week in the morning. We have a prayer meeting every week during the midday. And then we call, we used to call all the cell groups together every month to pray. To cry out to God. To plead with God for the people. Because we're not here for ourselves. We're here for the people of our neighborhood and our parish. I want to really urge you. I want to challenge you. Another thing we did when we went to York, uh, I met up with one Anglican and the Elim Pentecostal. We used to have what was called a minister's prayer and breakfast meeting. It was 95% breakfast and 5% prayer. So we just spent our time eating breakfast. Well, that's great, isn't it? And three of us said, we don't want to eat breakfast. We want to pray. And then we'll have a cup of tea and a piece of toast afterwards. So we switched it. And three of us covenanted to pray every week for the city of York, for revival in the city. We have been praying now for 14 years. We pray every week. That group has grown to about 30. Sometimes we get 40. We get Roman Catholics. We have Methodist, Pentecostal, Anglican, Baptist, and all stages in between. And we come and we praise God. It's always for one hour. We praise the Lord. It's pretty free and easy. We sing a lot in tongues. Then we wait for God. We do this every week. We wait for God. I don't lead it. There's a chap there who's got a great gift of leading us. And we wait for God to speak to us. And he does. Every week he speaks to us. And he speaks to us about different things. Sometimes he'll speak through a picture. Sometimes through a, a, a word. Sometimes through something that's happened to somebody. And then we pray into that. Sometimes we pray for the youth workers of the city. We get all the youth workers here. Sometimes we pray for the schools. Sometimes we pray for the city council, the hospitals. We pray for revival in the city of York. Now, I can tell you, I've only been in York for 14 years. Second year we were there, we had a mission in the Minster. 20,000 people came to hear the gospel in the Minster over 10 weeks. 
That was with J. John. Then we had, this was an amazing thing, we got permission from the Minster to have a banquet in the Minster. And Nicky came. We had not had a banquet in the Minster for 500 years. We had a banquet. 700 people came to the banquet. To launch, it was to launch alpha courses. We launched about 26 alpha courses on the back of that. We've had open air, barbecues. We've now got all sorts of ministries that have sprung up. Healing in the streets, CAP, working with uh, people who are pregnant. All sorts of wonderful social ministries, the food bank. It's all grown in the last few years. And I believe that the powerhouse for that has been the, prayer, the united prayer of the leaders, men and women, together, because God blesses that. So I could talk a lot about that. So speaking to, to God about people, uh, and, and then finally speaking to people about God. Now, what does he say? He says uh, a couple of things. He says, be wise in the way you behave, in your conduct. People watch you very carefully. Make the most of every opportunity. Take the opportunities and let your speech always be full of grace and seasoned with salt. So you, uh, how, how can your speech be salty? How can it be interesting? How can we talk about Jesus in a way that's interesting and not boring? Well, I'll tell you. If you're interested in Jesus Christ and you love him, you, you, won't, be, you won't be bored. So are you, are you interested in him? Do you love him? Is he doing things in your life? If he is, you'll talk about him in an interesting way. If, he, if it's not, if, it, if that line has gone dead, you won't have anything very interesting to say. It'll just be rather boring. Fresh fish. Doug talked, one of my chat, he talked about, bring fresh fish, Roger. We need fresh fish. Who are the new people coming to faith? Are people coming to faith? Are we seeing people coming to faith, following Jesus Christ? We should see that. That should be happening in our churches. If it's not happening, why is it not happening? We need to pray about that. So, and then finally, the, I think I just had five little things, some reflections as I finish, and then I'm going to hand over to John. Look for people of peace. Always look for people of peace. Who are the people who will welcome you. Now, I've learned a little principle on this. Do you remember Jesus sent them out? And he said, stay with the people of peace. I have found that the people of peace are the people, for me, are the people who like me and who I like. And they'll be totally different from the people that you like and who like you. There'll be some people, I used to think that everybody liked me. <laughs> they don't. I get up the nose of a lot of people. They don't like me. But there are certain people I really like and I get on with. I'll take, let you into a secret. I get on really well with millionaires. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but I just have an ability to mix with some of those high-voltage entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you some other stories at another time about that. So look for people who like you and who you like. They will be people of peace for you. And just think of this room. We're all in touch with different people, aren't we? So look for them. Secondly, remember the 3, 6, 9, 12. Look at a clock. If 12 o'clock is a person who is committed to Jesus Christ and following him, people are at different places on the clock. There are lots of people at 3. They're the kind of people where you invite... I'm always inviting people. I never stop inviting people to think. I'm a serial inviter. Most of the people I invite don't come. Occasionally they come, but it doesn't stop me inviting them. Some people, you would invite them to something like an Alpha course or something at the church, and they say, they'd say, if they were at three, they'd say, you must be mad. You'd never catch me dead in a church. People have said that. One lady in Hull, I was on a mission in Hull a few months ago. This is slightly rude, so apologies about this. We were out in the streets inviting people to come and hear Matthew, Mark's Gospel, a one-act play. And I went up to this lady in Hull and I said, look, we've got this great um, guy coming, he's a great actor, and we've got a one-act play of Mark's Gospel. 
can I give you an invitation? I handed her the invitation. You know what she said to me? Well, you can stick that up your ass. <laughs> I thought, well, I just burst into laughter. I just thought it was so funny. I thought, well, well done her. She, she's told me exactly what she thinks. They wouldn't say that in York, but Hull, that's what they say in Hull. In uh, Scarborough, certain parts of Scarborough, they've told me to just F off. That's okay. I can take that. It's not, not going to destroy me. It's okay. So there are a lot of people at three. Okay, there, that's where they are on the clock. There are some people at six, and they are people who are what I would call apathetic. They're not hostile, but they're apathetic. And I know lots of people at six. They're sort of, oh, well, another time. You know, maybe I'll think about it. Like this guy Jim I was telling you about, do you remember? He was at six initially, and you've just got to take them, you've got to take people where they are. Then there are people at nine on the clock, and they're the kind of people who will say to you, and they're all around us, they're all there. They'll say to us something like, do you know, I've been thinking about this. Maybe something's happened in their life. Maybe they've lost somebody, or somebody that they've known has been healed. Or, you know, as you were saying, Angus, I pray for people, or I've got... I've got three Yorkshire City footballer, footballers next to, living next to me in the next house. Quite tough guys. Two of them came back this weekend. They've both broken their uh, cartilage. They, they, they were playing Portsmouth. Two of them got smashed up. That's really serious business for them. They're on, they're on crutches. So I said to them, I'll pray for you absolutely blew them away. These are tough guys. There's a, little, there's a little chink there. They might, God might, whereas before they probably said, well, you can, you know, they might have been at six, but God's working in their life. We'll have them around for beer. We'll get to know them. They might move along. So I'm looking, I'm lo and then there are some who are at 11. You invite them and they say, yes, yes. I've been waiting for somebody to invite me. And there are people you know who are like that. They're just waiting for somebody like you to invite them. And nobody's invited them. So what I'm trying to say is that people are at different places and we need to remember that. And we need to ask God to guide us. I always want to be in at the, at the end. You know, I want to see them give their life. But, you know, I have to accept that not everybody's like that. So that's remember the three, six, nine, twelve. Next one. Develop a culture of invitation. Why are we not inviting people anymore to church? When did you last invite somebody to church? I'm not saying that to make you guilty. When did I last invite people to church? Why are we not doing this? We've got the greatest message in the world. We've got the greatest person in the world, Jesus Christ, who loves these people, he wants to set them free, and yet we're not inviting them. I wonder if you've asked yourself why we're not. Well, we might not be inviting them because we're embarrassed about what happened. Maybe we feel shame. Actually, when you've got an outsider in your meeting, you sit up, you start to do things differently, actually, when you've got an outsider. You start to look at things through different eyes. You don't go on as long. I know I'm going on, but you're all insiders. Um, <laughs> well, I think so. Uh, so you start, to r you start looking through the eyes of the person who's the visitor. And that's very good for us, because we become a club very, very quickly. So we need to develop... And I've got a friend called Keith DeBerry, and he says, and this is so wise... It's not a failure if we invite people and they don't come. It's only a failure if we don't invite them. We can't make anybody come. I can't make anybody come to anything, but I can invite them. We, make the, we, we get our thinking wrong. We think we've got to get them. You haven't got to get anybody to anything, but all you can do is invite them. Do you do it? Are you doing it? 
No, I don't think we are. And I'm the same, so I'm challenged by that. Jesus says, go out and invite. Go out into the highways and the byways. Next one. We need to reconnect the churches and the community. We did a mission recently in Cleckheaton. Now there's a place. I went to Cleckheaton with about that much faith. I thought, this will be terrible. It will be terrible. Tiny little churches, a burnt out um, Methodist minister, but an alive Anglican. So I said, I'll come. And I went on the train, and my heart was in my boots. I thought, this is going to be terrible. It's going to be so embarrassing. But I've been embarrassed before, so it's okay. I don't mind that. We got there, first night. These little churches, we went round the parish. We prayed, about 30 of us. And then, in the morning, we set a gazebo up in the middle of Cleckheaton. And it was the worst, you know, it was all your sort of horror sort of thing. I thought, oh no, it's going to be terrible. Put the gazebo and we had free tea and coffee and a prayer room in the gazebo. And we set this up in the, what was called the rubber tunnel in the arcade. And there was a team of us and we started to engage people in the streets in Cleckheaton. We had a questionnaire. We were asking the questions that uh, have been referred to, which I'll tell you about at another session. And people were frightened of us. I mean, they were frightened. They took one look at me my southern accent and they thought he's trying to get us to join the RAC <laughs> <laughs> and I would have felt just the same about if somebody like me came up to me in the street I think second hand car dealer that guy I'm not going to trust him so we gathered everybody together and we said we've got to say something that will re reduce because we were all we were trying to do was love these people we weren't out to get them to join anything. We just wanted to engage them. And one of the guys on the team who was a converted Jew from Huddersfield, he said, Roger, we should say to people that we're trying to reconnect the people with, of the community with the church. That's what we were trying to do. We were trying to, lots of them had stopped coming. We'd lost them. So we were trying to reconnect. So we started to go up to people and instead of going on with our survey and everything, we said, our opening line was, we're trying to reconnect the churches with the community. And the fear came down. And we started to have, and then the most amazing things. We had a pet show. We had one church. They, they, the vicar brought in a, a vet who was going to look, up, look at all the kids' pets for free. And the kids brought their pets and the parents came with the pets and the children and we had a we had a, a, a rosette for every pet the, the, the vet wrote out a little rosette so there was a prize given for the dog with the wackiest tail there was a prize given for the pet who least wanted to be at the pet show <laughs> and that was a little guinea pig which was a and then I brought a farmer in and he told them all, there were about 70 of them there, he told them about Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ had changed his life. People were absolutely gobsmacked. We had a very, various other meals. We had pie and peas, mushy peas and pork pies and mint sauce. Never had that before. And they said, you've never had that before, Roger. Where have you been all your life? I thought, where have I been? I've never had this before, mushy peas and mint sauce. And uh, the, final, the final day we had, the, me the final meeting, I'll tell you the truth, the final meeting was in Cleckheaton Town Hall on the Sunday, and I thought, we'll be lucky if we get 50 people. Do you know how many people came? 220 people. We had to put out extra seats. We preached the gospel. We explained to people how they could come to Christ. We gave them a chance to come to Christ. 38 people from Cleckheaton joined up on Alpha courses as a result. Brothers and sisters, if you could work in Cleck Eaton, <laughs> say no more. I think, was, that, was there any more, is that it? Oh, and the power of testimony, that's the other thing I'm learning. The power of the story. And at most of the meetings, we didn't give great learned explanations for the resurrection or, uh, you know, clever talks about 
the meaning of life, we talked about Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ has changed our life. And I brought people with me, alcoholics, big fat publican, and they simply spoke about Jesus Christ. And that's what people want to hear about, Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear about the church. They want to hear about Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ can change your life. Yeah? Okay. Can I ask you all to stand, please?